turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 67. Read the whole psalm together, and as always, would encourage you to, not only as we read it, but throughout the sermon, to keep your Bible or your phone open in front of you, uh, so that you can follow along through the passage, but also actually because the authority is in the Word of God, and not in the one who speaks it. And so I hope that you've got your Bibles open, so that if I said something whack, uh, you'd be able to say, no, 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 that's not what it says. So we'll read the whole psalm together. To the choir master, with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Will you pray with me now? Lord God Almighty, we do thank you that you are the God of all glory, that Lord, you are the one who has told us that your glory you will not give to another. And Father, we thank you that you tell us, Lord, that the day does draw nearer uh, when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow in singing your praise. And Father, we thank you that you are the God who reaches out to the nations, the God who is so great that you are worthy to be praised by all people. And so we pray for us now as we come under your word. We pray, Lord, that you would speak living words to us, that where we are apathetic, Lord, that you would fuel godly desires, where we are sinful, that you would grant repentance where we are sorrowful, that you would grant encouragement, and Lord, that we might indeed meet with you, our God. And we pray this for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, The start of a new year is always a good time to evaluate, isn't it? It's a time to set goals, seek direction, to seek to gain clarity on the year ahead. Why are we here as a church? What are we trying to achieve? What do we expect God to achieve through us? What are we praying to God to achieve through us? You see, churches, just like businesses, just like other organizations, just like human beings in general, now they lose focus. They fall into ruts. Now we start churches with blazing zeal, our godly ambitions and prayers, and then give it a few years or a few generations, and we're in maintenance mode. Now we exist to keep going. We do what we do because that's what we've always done. We lose clarity as an urgency as to why we exist in the first place. So how do we participate in the work that God is doing in 2023? Well, God's speaking through this psalm, and he's speaking with exactly the same authority as if you could hear his audible voice Uh, right now. And he's telling us how to do just that. 
And maybe you picked up as we read through the psalm that actually it's not that complicated. Right? This psalm is a call for all the nations uh, to come and bless God. Uh, the psalm is a call for God to bless his people so that his praise might spread to all the ends of the earth. There's a very clear goal that the nations would be glad and sing and praise to God. And there's a very clear means uh, that God would bless his people. And so first we're going to think about that goal, and then we're going to think about the means that God has appointed unto it. So the goal is let the nations be glad. And really this psalm takes us into the very heart and eternal plan of God. And it's a psalm that tells us without the least equivocation that God cares for the nations, that God cares for all the peoples of the earth. Right, you can't miss that in this psalm. Uh, verse 2, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. And verses 3, and then again in verse 5, let the people praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. You see, this entire, in fact, the entire structure of this psalm uh, was a Hebrew literary device which was made to focus in on verse 4. So it's a little bit hard to see. But if you're interested, go at home, study it, and you'll see that actually this entire psalm has this kind of parallel pattern to it that centers in on verse 4, where it says, Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. You see, what's the driving purpose of this psalm and of God's plan contained in it? that the nations would be glad to sing for joy and praise of God. And what I really want you to notice from this psalm is particularly the missional heart of God. You see, our God's a missionary God. He's a God on mission. He always has been. He always has been from the very beginning, the God of all the nations of the earth the God who deserves to be praised by all peoples everywhere all of the time. You see, Israel needed this psalm because they tended to become a very Israel-centric. And we need this psalm because we too become, tend to become very church or inward-centric. Now we focus on God's love and care for us, which is very real and very true, and we forget that actually he's a God who also cares for all of the nations of the earth. You see, we l serve the God who loves his people with an unspeakable love and yet cares for the unbelieving nations and peoples uh, and calls them to return to him. And it seems that the logic of the psalm was that all the nations would see what God is like through uh, the story and the life of Israel, that the very character of God would be sketched out in the history of a nation, that the nations around would see God's treatment of Israel and see what sort of God he was. And often for us in churches, uh, we can become a bit blasé about this. Right? We've all heard it since Sunday school, we know it. And we can forget, actually, just how staggering that history was. A slave nation, overcoming nation after nation after nation. You see, it's no wonder that, Mo that the king of Moab hired Balak to, uh, Balaam to curse Israel. This was unheard of. A slave nation should never have been able to escape from the mighty empire of Egypt. They should never have been, been able to get through the vast expanse of the Red Sea. They should never have survived 40 years in the harsh desert. And they certainly shouldn't have been able to overthrow the mighty nations of Canaan. You see, their history was a story. It was a witness. It was a testimony that the nations would look at them and see, 
This is the sort of God that he is. That actually he's not simply another of the pantheon of kind of so-called gods. No, this is a God like no other. This is a God of power and patience, majesty and meekness, intimacy and immensity, a God who loves and a God who judges. And actually, if they were to sing and shout for joy at God's salvation played out in the life of Israel, then how much more in the life of Christ? You see, if you're amazed at Mount Cook, then you should see Mount Everest. You see, when you come to the New Testament, you see the very character of God traced out, not in the history of a nation, but instead in the life of a human, the life of one who lived and died. And you see salvation and deliverance not over human empires, but over spiritual ones. You see, not brittle iron chains shattered, but instead the far greater chains of sin and death itself. You see, this psalm is a call for the nations to be glad and praise the God who reveals himself in Jesus Christ. There's one question that I often think to myself. And the question is, is my view of God in line with God's view of God? Is the way I think about him uh, in balance with who he reveals himself to be in the scriptures? And it's a very important question. Because the way that you think about God, who you think he is and what you think he's like, will shape in fundamental ways what your Christian life looks like. And actually this psalm tells us without a shadow of a doubt that actually the one true God is the missionary God. That actually the God who we serve and has revealed himself in Jesus Christ is the God whose great work in this world is to draw lost sinners into life and fellowship with himself. A God who's at work to spread his own renown to all the ends of the earth. I wonder if that aligns with how you think of God. Do you think of him as being the missionary God? The God who not only loves you, but yet cares for the nations and longs and calls and commands them to repent and turn to him. So if this is the great goal, that all the nations would praise him, that his renown would spread to the ends of the earth, then actually according to God's word, now what are the means that he has instituted for it? And the means is that God may bless us. I'm not sure if you picked it up while we read through it. Uh, it's quite, the logic of this psalm is quite easy to miss. But it's actually really profound once you see it. So if you look at verse 1, it says there, May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us. Uh, why? To what end? Uh, verse 2. So that your way may be known on earth, your saving people, am- saving power among all nations. So it's the start of the psalm. If you jump to the end of the psalm, it says, God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And then in the ESV, it says, let all the ends of the earth fear him. But actually, in most other translations, it says, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. And the simple point is that it is as God blesses his people that his renown is spread to all the ends of the earth. Right? I mean, that's just what it says, isn't it? They say, bless us so that your renown might spread. Right? Just like there was with Abraham, which Carl read for us, that God blesses his people so that they might be a blessing. And really the profound truth here is that actually the gospel goes out and God's mission is accomplished as God blesses his people 
with his presence. Right, you see that in the Old Testament. That the times when Israel, Israel's leaders walked nearest to God, uh, were there times when the nation flourished and they were best able to influence the nations around them. You see, in the New Testament, that actually it was in Acts, as the Holy Spirit is poured out and God blesses his people, that actually the work of evangelism and missions blossoms. And you see it in church history, that again and again and again, especially in the history of revivals, that it's as God blesses his people that the gospel goes with power to all the nations. Right, that's why we call it a revival. You don't revive something that's dead like the world. No, it's a reviving of the church. Right, that's what's happened in history again and again and again, that God has poured his spirit upon his church, revived them, awakened them, and from there it goes out to all the nations. Now, you've probably seen it in our church or in other churches that you've been part of. That actually it's as the Spirit is powerfully at work in the church that the gospel draws people in. And that the gospel has this compelling, almost magnetic power. That as the Spirit drives us deeper and deeper into the gospel, uh, we're compelled all the more to go out and share that and speak that with others. You see, the driving point of this psalm is bless us so that your praise might spread. Bless us not simply for our good, but for the good of the nations. Bless us so that your praise and renown might ripple out like waves in a pond. And so actually, if we want to be a healthy church this next year, a church that's in line with the God of the Scriptures, and then we need to pray and plead and beg for the blessing and the grace of God upon us as a church. We need to plead with him that he would cause his face to shine on us. That he would be powerfully at work in us by his Holy Spirit. You see, the strength or weaknesses of our efforts and our ministries as a church rise or fall with the strength or weakness of God's blessing upon us. Right, we're a spiritual institution. We rest in all of our efforts, rest in the blessing of God himself. In Zechariah 4 and verse 6, it says, Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so if we're begging, pleading God to bless us as a church so that his praise might spread, then actually we need to be clear on what do we even mean by blessing. Right, blessing can be a fairly vague or kind of generic word. Someone sneezes and bless you. You go on a lovely holiday and hashtag bless. Right, blessings often used as almost a synonym of kind of just happy or comfortable. But that's not what the scriptures mean when they talk about bless. Now hopefully you picked up that in verse 1, uh, when it says there, uh, may God be gracious to us, bless us, and make his face shine upon us. Uh, that, that was an echo of the ironic blessing uh, that Carl read to us from Numbers chapter 6. That actually God blessing us is nothing less than actually God drawing near to his people by his presence. That God's greatest blessing is himself with his people. God is the greatest gift he gives us. And so actually when we pray and we beg with God that he would bless us as a church, we're not necessarily praying for more finances. We're not necessarily praying for numerical growth. We're not necessarily praying for highly gifted Christians, though we'll accept them if they come. No, we're praying that actually we would know more of the grace of God, that we would know God better that we would live more consciously in his presence and walk more consistently in line with his word and his spirit. And we're praying that God would manifest himself to us by his word and his spirit. 
And so if we want to be part of God's plans and purposes as a church in 2023, uh, we need to be praying, God, be gracious to us. God, bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. We need to be praying in faith uh, for a powerful movement of his Holy Spirit. And the blessing that God gives to his people in many ways is kind of both objective and subjective. Now you might think of a marriage. Right? The moment you say, I do, in marriage, you're objectively married. From that point, you are a husband or a wife. But you can certainly enjoy more or less of that marriage subjectively. You can have a wonderful marriage or you can have a, a more painful marriage. Now, you might think of a family, right? Objectively, you are part of the family you were born into. But subjectively, you can enjoy that as a wonderful thing or as something that is difficult and hard. And in many ways, it's quite similar with the blessing of God that objectively, you are under God's blessing. If you're a Christian, you are a child of God, loved by God. But don't stop there. Don't stop with the marriage papers going through. No, you want to know more of what that blessing influences in your life. So objectively, the blessing of God has been purchased for you in Christ. It's yours now. And subjectively, we're asking, pleading, praying, hungering for more of the experience of that blessing. Now, one con personal conviction that I've had for a long time now is that I think we are far too satisfied when it comes to our life with God. I think as Christians and as churches, uh, we can often bring almost insultingly low expectations of what a life lived with Christ can be, of actually the joy that he offers us, of the hope and peace that he can work in us by his Holy Spirit, of the soul-satisfying experience of truly walking in step with his Holy Spirit. You see, if you would take God at his word and really believe maybe he does offer to us what he says he offers to us, then actually, surely your and my experiences of him so far are just a drip in an ocean. That there is so much more of Christ that we can know. So actually, as we enter into a new year, I call you to pray, to seek, to plead that God would be gracious to us, that God would bless us, and that God would cause his face to shine upon us. Not that we would feel good about ourselves. Not that we would compare ourselves favorably to other churches. No, so that God's way may be known on earth. So that his saving power might be known in all of the nations. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, We know that in many of these things, Lord, we are but children. That, Lord, we see but the merest shadow of the radiance of your glory and of just how worthy you are to be praised. And, Father, we do pray, our Lord, that the nations would sing and be glad we do pray that the peoples would praise you. We do pray that all over this world, you would be drawing your people, your sheep to yourself. And Lord, to that end, we pray that you would bless us. Bless us as Christians. Bless us as a church. Bless us as churches here in New Zealand uh, so that your way might be known and so that your renown might spread to all the ends of the earth. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.